All right, YouTube, we back for part two of following the call. I said previously that we were going to go from Galatians chapter 115 into Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. So we're going to read right now Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We'll gather those points for this, and we'll be done with that topic for now. All right. <clears throat> Let's move the camera. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. And when James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So let's get through these 10 verses <clears throat> and see what God wants to tell us here. Number one, only time will tell. Only time will tell. Right. So after 15 years, right, that's what I want you to get focused in your mind for 15 years in the first part of this video, we see that Paul went up to Jerusalem. He took three years. He was in Arabia and he was in Damascus. After those three years, he went to Jerusalem to speak with Peter. And then he stayed there 15 days. He left again. He didn't go back after that 15 days for 15 total years. So between the first time he went to Jerusalem, it was 15 years between the time he returned to Jerusalem. He didn't know what manner of gospel they were preaching. He didn't know what they were doing. He didn't know what they had been doing. He was only focused on his calling, which is why it's important. He was only focused on what God had called him to do. Then he come, when he comes and he finds out what they're preaching, he sees that it was wrong. So he visited them for the second time. He talked with Peter. He gave his testimony. So what reason did he need to return to Jerusalem? Because the way I'm speaking on it is because we know the Bible and we know how it worked out in the end. But at the time, think, put yourself in the shoes of Paul. Why am I going back to a place which I've already, I've already dealt with? I've already went to Jerusalem. I've already preached the gospel. I've already given my testimony. What does God need me to be here for? And that's letting us know that even if we don't understand what God is calling us to do, we still need to obey it because it's going to work out in the end. This is showing us that because Paul couldn't, there's no way he could have understood why he is going back to Jerusalem. Why is the spirit leading me back to a place which I've already been and I've already done what he had called me to do there? But he's telling you to go backwards to a place that you thought you was never going to come back to, to re-preach that gospel so that they can hear you and then they can see you again. And you can see why. So he finds out through Revelation that once he returned to Jerusalem, he needed to reveal the calling God placed in him to the Jewish flock of Christ. So the first time he went to Jerusalem, and this ties in with the first video, the first time he went to Jerusalem, I told you that God decides when we need to tell people the calling that he placed in us or the times when we need to keep it private. At that time, when he first went to Jerusalem for those 15 days, he didn't clearly he didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell anybody that what he knew about Christ and what Christ had revealed to him was different. He just preached his testimony. And then when he went after 15 years, God put it on his heart to reveal to them the calling that he had placed inside of Paul. And that let them know that something that they were doing was wrong, right? It wasn't about the circumcision anymore because God desires mercy rather than sacrifice. It wasn't about keeping the law 
but yet believing in Christ. It was about living in Christ, which is living in the freedom of Christ. Because Christ has died for me, it matters not that I'm circumcised or uncircumcised. It matters not that I keep the Sabbath day or I don't keep the Sabbath day. It matters not that I go to the festival days or I don't go to the festival days. None of that means anything because I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If I believe in him and I have faith in him, I am free from the law of sin and death. And it's not to be entangled with that law of bondage because it will trip you up when you're talking about the freedom of Christ. So <clears throat> what he did was, even though he saw that they were wrong, there was different ways to do it, right? So he did it because they were still believers. They believed in Christ because he said there were churches in Judea who were in Christ. They believed in Christ, but they also they glorified the fact that brothers had to be circumcised as was custom in the days of the law, which is why I told you about the Jews and the Gentiles, because when Paul preached to the Gentiles, they had no pushback because they didn't receive this other gospel that if you're not circumcised, if you don't commit, commit to these rules, if you don't live a certain way, then God not going to accept you. They had received that in the Jewish place. So when he went to the Jewish temple and he spoke to the people in the synagogue, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like pulling teeth from an alligator. Like you telling me that I'm free in Christ, but I have to be circumcised. You telling me that I have to do this, but God said I can't eat the animal that chews the cud. You telling me that I got to do this, but I got to do that. So they're trying to reconcile the fact that they believe one thing and now God, the gospel that they have preached from Jesus is completely different. Or it's not completely different, but it's freedom. So one is keeping you in bondage to a certain level of rules and certain rules. And one is telling you, you are free because God can work everything together. <clears throat> so the mindset that they had that was speaking on and preaching on circumcision was not the mindset that Christ had. Because he says, you, if, you was, if you really spent time with me and you were paying attention, you would know that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. When he was, when he was speaking to the woman, right? Remember when she was committing adultery? And the, and the people called her and they said, Jesus, she should be stoned according to the law, right? She should be stoned according to the law. And he said, man, if you were paying attention to what I'm doing and the works that I'm doing among you, you would know that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I'm not going to kill this woman. I'm going to forgive her and show you how to be a person that lives truly by the law. Because the law is fulfilled in loving those as, oh, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, Right? That's the most important thing when it comes to people. The most important thing when it comes to God is to love the Lord our God with our heart, our mind, and our strength. To love God completely and totally. And to, to love him completely is to do what? To submit to his commandments. So that means in all things, do it to the glory of God. That is what satisfies God. What satisfies men is mercy. And God wants us to be merciful towards men and women because who are we to be unforgiving when God forgave us? Who are us to be harsh and, and mean when God was merciful and compassionate towards us, right? He wants us to model him and follow after what he did for others. So this mindset was not the mind of Christ who sought mercy instead of sacrifice. This was contrary to what the Jews believed and taught. So number two, Paul showed us, he, he demonstrated for us how to correct a brother or sister in Christ. So let's go re reread that scripture. He says, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So why would he speak to them privately? <clears throat> Even though Paul knew that their teachings were incorrect, he did not put them on blast. Some of us, we talk too much and we talk too loud. We want everybody to know that we right. We want everybody to know that I'm doing it right and you not. And you don't know. And you not seeing God. You not hearing from God. Everything you do is wrong. We're making reaction videos on YouTube. We're getting the likes, the followers, the clicks. And we destroy your ministry and the purpose. Now, would God be pleased with your likes, your clicks, and your followers if that, that, that flock gets dispersed? God will send you straight to the lakes of fire. Because it doesn't matter that you're saved if you're going to destroy other people's souls that God is still working on to save them. Even if this teacher may be wrong, you must restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And this is what Paul was modeling for us. So instead of putting them on blast, he corrected them in private, in private, where no one is around, so that he would not cause division in their flocks. And this is what Paul told us about in other New Testament texts. He said that 
Beware of those who cause division, who seek their own. They're seeking their own gain, right? If Paul comes around, he's preaching the gospel of, of, of freedom in Christ, right? We're free from the law of sin and death. Why would someone come up and say that you need to be circumcised? It's to cause confusion. Now, it's not that they're a bad person. They may not know. They may not understand it. Or it may be that Satan is working inside of them. We don't know exactly as of yet, but we know that they're causing division. And that division is going to splinter the body of Christ off into many groups. And look at the world nowadays. You have Calvinists. You have Christians. You have Jewish. You have, um, you have what's it called? Methodists. You have Protestants. You have Baptists. You got all these different denominations and different dogmas of beliefs. When Christ never had a different dogma, it was simply you free in Christ. This is the one belief we all supposed to be united on. And we all have different ways of reading our Bible. We all have different ways of looking at scriptures. We have different ways of receiving the Holy Spirit. It's a lot of mess going on. And this is exactly what Paul was trying to avoid when he spoke to them in private. But clearly, it didn't take when other people got hold of the word because then they started to lower their own beliefs over other people's. In the same way that Paul was trying to prove to us that this was unnecessary. So... He modeled Jesus in the way that he handled the situation, much like Jesus did not get upset with people, namely the Pharisees, for misunderstanding him, but he revealed wisdom to them in a way that they could receive it. So his mercy, through Jesus' mercy, he, received, he, he gave them the same story he was going to give them. He just gave it to them in a way that they could better understand it. So think of it this way. When they say, Jesus, they don't say necessarily Jesus, they don't understand, but they would challenge him and say, you ain't the son of God. Right here it says that God shall come like this, that, and the third. And then he has to tell them a parable, right? Something that's filled with wisdom because you have to have wisdom to break down a complicated thing and put it in simpler terms. So he gave them a parable that they can easily understand, but still get those, the meat of the story, what he was trying to give, right? In the same way that Nathan when David had committed the sin and slept with Bathsheba and God was displeased with him, David wasn't able to hear from God. He wasn't able to hear that, that God was, he wasn't able to hear that he was being disobedient and that something he did was wrong. He was in his pride, but he, it wasn't that he was a bad person. He just couldn't hear. It. And then when he sent Nathan, Nathan recognized that David needed to be corrected, but he didn't speak to him like with disrespect. He didn't speak to him and put him on blast. He spoke to him in a way that he can understand. So he gave him a parable and let him know. And then as, as he spoke the parable, David came to his, the, on his own conclusion. He said, so he's stealing, he's stealing people's sheep. Oh, we need to go get him right now. We need to have justice. He said, David, you are the man who stole the sheep. And then right then, through revelation of the Holy Spirit, David knew he, the sheep is Bathsheba. And he is the man who's the thief. And the other man was Uriah, his best friend. So he now understood what they were trying to tell him, but he just couldn't hear it from God. He had to hear it from a other source who could make it more simple, right? But that was all through the power of God. That was all through the works of God, right? So God can do everything himself, but he chooses to use humans because of his mercy and his grace, right? So number three, titles does not equal qualification. Beware of admiring other men and women. So some may be walking according to the purposes of God and some may not. So God put it this way. You shall not covet, right? We, we are not to be covetous, but we are to submit ourselves completely to what God has called us to. And then by that, we can avoid being distracted by what others do and have, right? <clears throat> so some of us need to stop idling rich men. You love Jeff Bezos. You love the Instagram. You love looking at what this girl looks like and what you don't look like. You love looking at what this dude got and what you don't got. You love looking at how they can dress and you can't dress. Or some of us idolize skin color or eye color or something even more, you know, that's pretty much pointless compared to what God is purposing to do in your life. It means nothing. But because we're distracted by this, we can never get in what God's purpose is for our lives. Or say it this way. If you work at a certain job and you're having success, and you and your friend or people that you've grown to be acquainted with, y'all work at the same job. And then God calls them out to do something different for his kingdom. But you don't get it because you're not called. So now instead of you focusing on what God called you to do and paying attention to what, okay, did God want me to leave or God want me to stay? Does God meet me here or does God meet, meet me there? You watching what Sheila doing and you want to follow Sheila. So Sheila left and she doing this. 
But if you try to leave and do this, it's not going to work for you because that's not what God has for you. And you have to wait until God calls you out of that situation for him to work in you to do the new thing. Because it's God that purpose. Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he knows who we are. He knows that this job is not the purpose he has for us, but he has us there for a reason for a certain season because there's a time and a season for everything. So he has us there for a season to learn something and then he's going to have us somewhere else in a different season to still live out our purposes. But through God's timing, we realize that we are free in Christ, right? It is through God's mercy because he could easily just pull you out and say, go do this, but he know you're not prepared. So sometimes he needs to leave you in a certain season so that you can develop a little bit more so that when you get to this next season, your character won't disqualify you at the the new platform that you'll be in or with the new influence that you'll have or maybe with the new promotion that he chooses to give you, right? So, <clears throat> also we need to realize that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above. And so if every good and perfect gift comes down from God, why idolize the person who seems successful? It may Number one, it may not be what it seems. They may seem successful in one area, but they could very well be a failure in a different area. A lot of times, if you look at it, rich people, because they are always off at work and they're leaving their families and they're making so much money, when they get on a the deathbed, they realize, man, I didn't spend enough time with my kids. I chased after the money. I provided food. I provided clothes. I provided shelter, but I didn't give my time. But what did Jesus do? Jesus was able to give his time, his treasure, his his his, his ability, his gifts, his everything for the kingdom of God. And that's the model that we should follow. Not to be so great in one area, but be a failure in any area. We're supposed to be balanced in all areas. And that's what Jesus modeled after. So some of us need to be delivered from that spirit of idolatry and focus on what God placed in us. Because when you choose some distraction over what God called you, you will never be satisfied. You will always be looking for the next, good, the next fix. When you're on drugs, you're trying to get that, that first high back. When you first have sex, it's never going to be compared to the, the 15th time you have sex. It's just how it is, right? We have experiences and we learn and we grow. So if you keep chasing after something that will be a distraction as opposed to living in God's purposes, you'll realize that you're not actually free. You're in bondage to that actual chase. You're in bondage to that thirst, that hunger, that lust that's within your flesh. Number four, God can use anything. So even though I just said we should not idolize a man's calling, we have to realize that even if we have that in us and we need to be delivered, yes, but God can still use you at that level. So think of it this way. There's people who idolize someone's calling or their positions. God still uses them even though they're in a problematic mindset. Think of it this way. When a, when, a, when a girl who should be having sex, 15, 16 years old, and she has a baby, but this person that's speaking to her, she wants to get an abortion. Let's say she wants to get an abortion. She wants to get an abortion, and God sends someone to speak to her. They're not qualified. They don't have to be a preacher. They just have to be someone who values life, and God will use whatever, whatever he can use, that good and that perfect knowledge that's within them, and he'll leave the bad alone just to get his purposes achieve so that she will not have that abortion that she'll see the pregnancy through. And then maybe in 10 years, maybe 15, maybe 20, she realizes that this is the reason why God wanted me to have that child. Because number one, I'd be miserable if I made that decision without praying. And number two, I'd be miserable because this child is the one who's going to bless me after he gets old, right? After he gets older, he's going to be the one that's going to be carrying my blessing, right? So you just never know how God will use you or work out your circumstances, which is why we can't make rash decisions. We have to be focused on the calling that God placed in us, focusing on doing the work that he told us to do. But also, if you finna make a decision, he tell you not to do it, you got to consider that. You got to, was that God or was that something else? You got to, because sometimes you're going to be deceived. He's going to try to deceive you. The enemy will always try to distract you. If he can't deceive you, he'll distract you. So you got to realize some things that you're doing that you know is right, continue to do them. And some things that you're doing that you know is wrong, you know that's God talking to you. That ain't no enemy. You know that you shouldn't be unforgiveful, uh, unforgiving. You know that you shouldn't be trying to be violent and be assaulting people. You know that you shouldn't be cursing and talking crazy to other people and, and speaking all ill of other people. You know that you shouldn't be doing that. So you don't need the enemy to deceive you with that. Some of this stuff is just in the word. And some things are 
not completely able to be understood. And we need God to correct us, right? If God say, you need to be delivered from pornography, you may never watch pornography again, but you watching certain shows that show a little too much. You watching certain shows that lead you, you know, you, you traveling down that line. You traveling down that line right to sin, but you don't actually commit to sin. You don't actually commit the thing, but you're thinking about it. And now it's entering your heart. Now it's poisoning the will that God is trying to regenerate. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes, even though you're not committing that actual sin, you're doing enough to still have the effects of that sin. So you're still doing enough to have, it's almost like, I may not be fully drunk, but because I keep drinking, I'm developing a dependence on drinking. I may not be fully drunk like this person is and throwing up, but I'm still, uh, I've drunk enough liquor that I think that I needed to go to sleep. And now I'm bound by drinking liquor before I go to sleep, as opposed to allowing God to put sleep in my eyes, right? <clears throat> so going back to the scriptures, I said that even if you idolize a man's calling or possessions, God can still use that problematic mindset. So proving with the scripture, the people who looked up to Peter, James, and John received Paul and his testimony and the gospel that he was preaching. They only received it after Peter, James, and John received him. So these people were weak in their faith. They only received his testimony because the leaders that they looked up to received it. So they idolized Peter, James, and John because they walked with Jesus. And they're like, well, if you walk with Jesus, then you must know what you're talking about. They didn't believe Paul because Paul, you, number one, they said, you're not an apostle. They're the 12 apostles. You, you some imposter. But they didn't realize that the Holy Spirit had set aside Paul for his own purpose. And the Holy Spirit is what gave Paul to be an apostle. He didn't do it in front of everybody. So there was no proof of him being an apostle. But until you see the work that God did in him, then you would realize it. So sometimes if you think you know everything, you might want to quiet down and pray about it before you make a video or make a reaction to it because you don't know what God told that person to do. You have no clue. It's not that God wants us to make mistakes, but it's that God can use our mistakes for his will, for his glory. So he don't need you to comment on every single thing that's going on. Sometimes he just needs you to be patient. He said, don't judge a thing before it's time, before it's all said and done. There's a judgment day at the end. Everything will be judged. He don't need you to judge every single move a person makes. You're not God. You don't know what he's doing. You don't know what wisdom he put inside this person to do what they're doing. Even if they may have did it wrong, he can still use them because God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. It's not for you to be a judge. It's for you to sit back and do whatever God called you to do and allow them to do whatever God called them to do. And whatever, when God want to put y'all together, he'll, he'll make y'all connect. And if you want to keep y'all apart, he'll keep y'all apart. So we got to be so careful on Speaking of other people's lives and what people are doing, some things are blatant sins. And yes, you should try to restore that person in the spirit of gentleness. You should, you know, model Jesus the best you can. But you're not a judge. Let's not forget that you're not a judge. God did not call you to judge the world. He called you to be in the world. That's it. For you to be a servant of God, not to play God. All right. <clears throat> so some people are followers and they need to be led. This don't make them a bad person because they idolize other people. This makes them followers and this makes them weak in their faith. But that doesn't make you a bad person because God tells us how to, up, he tells us what to do and how to treat those who are weak in the faith. He tells us that we must uphold those that are weak and be patient and walk in love. That's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He tells us that we must uphold the weak, even though they're weak and they're not as strong as us faithfully or in the faith. They don't understand what we understand and believe what we believe. We must bear with them because Jesus bore our burdens. This is why he went to the cross. We're, he said the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> if the wages of sin is death, how are we still living? Because Jesus got on that cross and he bore our punishment. He took our lashes. He took our, he took our, he, he, they spit on him because we were supposed to get spit on they crucified him because we were supposed to be crucified. We were supposed to be burning in the hill. But he went on the cross and died for us so that we didn't have to. So he bore our burdens in the same way that if we follow in Jesus truly, we should bear other people's burdens. Just because they're weak don't mean that you got to call them weak. You have to understand that, pray about it, but bear that burden, right? And if you need to, set them aside, pull them aside where nobody can hear you and nobody can be messy and be a busybody and let them know that they're making a mistake. Let them know in private, in the, in the presence of God, because God is everywhere. God don't need you to try to correct them in front of everybody. 
trying to put them to shame. That's not the point of it. The point is that you restore them in the spirit of gentleness and then people can see the work of God through them. But they're not losing the people that they already have because it's all about the flock. It's all about the body of Christ. If I try to correct you in public and the people say, well, if he got that wrong, who's to say anything he's saying is right? Now the flock don't have trust in this man anymore, but that's not what God intended. He intended for you to restore them privately and then God will work in that man either to say what he needs to say or correct whatever he, whatever he, whatever he had done wrong within that flock, right? <clears throat> We've seen that a lot in, in modern churches right now where people may make a mistake and the public, they, they, they castrize them. I mean, they ostracize them. They say, oh, he's crazy. He's not hearing from God. There's no way he's hearing from God. And then this guy, <clears throat> you judge him and you, you make it seem like you know everything about him. And then maybe a year or so later, you find out that it was God that was working in him to do that. It was God that was working in him to, even though he looked crazy at the time, it worked out for everyone's good. Think about Jesus. Why did Jesus go to the cross? It was because it was God's will. He didn't do it because he loved it. He didn't do it because he wanted to. He did it because it was God's will. And Jesus, why would you go to the cross? If you hear and you're able to put the, the, the law to death or if you're able to heal people and restore the blind and do so many things that you're doing, why would you leave us? Stay with us. That's what the disciples begged and pleaded him to do. But he said, I must do my father's will. And when he did his father's will, they didn't realize at the time, but he was going to be setting everybody, including them, free from their sins forever in past, the present and the future. So he had to do that to accomplish God's will for everybody. But they wanted him to, you know, continue to dwell with them, become a king over Israel and then sit on the throne. And that was only going to be a short lived reign as opposed to what Jesus can do now because he's in heaven. And he can be the covering for and the advocate for your past sins, your present sins and whatever sins you might commit in the future. Right. <clears throat> so the last thing I'm going to say, and we're going to call it a day for part two. Patience. Love and self-control are fruits of the Holy Spirit. So even if people are weak, we must have self-control. We must walk in love. And we must be patient with people. And we must always try to win them back. Right? This is what Jesus did. He never gave up on people. He never relented and threw his hands up. He always worked on them. He worked on them and he worked on them and he worked on them. And he's going to continue to work on you until the day comes where, this, where, you know, where the rapture comes or the end of the days come. Whatever comes first, God is going to continue to work in you. Philippians 1 6. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he will continue to work in you until he comes back. So we must do the same with other people. Even if they're not where, where we think they should be, or they didn't listen to us the first time. I know you feel like you don't have time, but what did God tell you to do? Be patient. Be patient with all people. So let's model that in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray that that blessed you. All right.